Okay. So I pray that you are soaking in the rich truths of Romans as we've now completed half of the chapters in this glorious book. As a way of brief reminder, let's quickly, <laughs> I told somebody I'm going to do this in 10 minutes. We'll see. Uh, quickly recap what we have seen thus far as we prepare to move into another section of the epistle. So Paul begins this epistle by identifying himself first and foremost as a bondservant of Christ Jesus. And he wants to be clear that he's writing to them as a man who has fully surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, just as a way of reminder, we discussed when we saw this, that the word for bondservant is doulos in the Greek. Okay. And that means that it represents a slave that he's fulfilled his period of servitude. But at the end of that time, he realizes that he is better off under the care of his master than he is on taking care of himself. And so he willingly submits himself to be this person's, his master's servant for the rest of his life. And what they would do it, during biblical times, if somebody chose to be a bond servant, they willingly chose to be a servant, they would take the earlobe and use an awl, one of those tools to pierce a big hole in the ear, representing that I am publicly declaring I am better off with this man as my master than I am being my own master. I still, I, I know there's a lot of kids that do sort of that thing now. I just don't know if they realize there's actually some biblical meaning behind what that actually represents. So Paul, following his Damascus Road conversion experience, saw himself with this same type of wholehearted commitment to Jesus. And the entire letter that he has written in the book of Romans comes from the heart of a man who wants everyone to see his master as he sees him and to make the same choice to fully surrender to the leadership and the control of the Holy Spirit over each life. So he begins laying out the evidence piece by piece. Now, do we all know our key verse by now? Well, let's see. Here we go. Romans 1, 16, 17. For I, say it with me. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Awesome. So it's, and when it talks about that to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is not a matter of the Jews being first string and the Gentiles are the bench players, okay? It's also not that the Jews are being replaced by the Gentiles. Instead, what Paul is saying is that God sent the good news to the Jews first as his messengers to be able to witness to the world. In the fullness of time, after Jesus came to be the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, and the Jews rejected him, then the gospel was given to the Greeks or the Gentiles. And the message of it all is explained in verse 17, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, it is God's righteousness that is revealed or shown as you step out in faith and you place your trust in him. And as your faith grows, you begin to see more of his righteousness manifested in you and through you. And that is an amazing and overwhelming concept. Okay. Now let's see if we remember a little bit about the structure of the book of Romans. So Romans one through three twenty established what truth? All have sinned. Remember we said sin Romans one through three twenty. So I've written this in a way we're going to personalize it. We would say, I am a sinner. Paul clearly explains, beginning in Romans 1.18, that man is without excuse because God has made his existence known to all men. But the problem is men suppress the truth in unrighteousness and they'll spiral down deeper into wickedness as long 
as man refuses to acknowledge God and repent of his sins. And that means chapter one was aimed primarily at which group? You remember? Who's he talking to in Romans 1, 18 through the end of chapter one? Is he talking to the Jews or the Gentiles? That's the Gentiles, right? Because the Gentiles are the one man is without excuse and man is just going to spiral down in this sinful way. But there is another way in which men suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And that's where Paul in chapter two begins to nail the Jews with their own rejection of God by explaining that they have chosen the law over Christ. Okay. In terms we might relate to, that's when you would say you've chosen rules over a relationship or religion over a relationship. And Paul makes every effort to show everyone in these first three chapters that they're unable to save themselves and they're in need of a savior. So as we move into a new section, Romans 3, verse 21 through chapter 5, we are now hearing Paul explain what concept? You go from sin to salvation. salvation. Exactly. I am a sinner who has been saved. Okay. And what we see is that Paul boldly states in Romans 3, 28, that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And you remember who he used as his chief example in Romans 4? Abraham. Abraham. Now, I hope you're noticing, think about this. The Gentiles were chapter one. So far, we've talked about chapter two, chapter three, chapter four is all aimed at who? the Jews primarily, do you see how much more effort it takes to convert a religious man than a pagan? Absolutely. You have to, somebody who's totally outside the tentacles of religion is more aware of their need for a savior than somebody who thinks they're religious. So only took one chapter for the Gentiles. Paul is focusing on the Jews now, and he explains that you're either under the headship of Adam who is the original rebel who ushered sin into the world in the garden, or you're under the headship of the new Adam, Jesus, who brings get the gift of righteousness and reconciliation to God. So after establishing the basis of justification, which is being saved by faith through grace, and that is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what verse, everybody knows that one, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Paul then spends chapter 6 through 8 descri describing the next process or the next step in the process of salvation, which is we had sin, salvation. Now it's what? Sanctification. Exactly. All right. So we're going to go ahead and put sanctific. Well, if I can get it to work. Hello. There we go. Sanctified up here. Sanctification. So let's go ahead and you've got it on your sheet, but let's say it together. I am a sinner who has been saved and sanctified. And then the end of this would be by God's sovereignty for God's service. Okay, that gives us the whole outline of the book of Romans, but we're going to be focusing on sovereignty now. So he, uh, we're talking right now about in chapter six, he explains we've been united with Christ in his death and we are raised to a new life. And the fact that he is now living in us provides all that's needed to conquer those desires of the flesh. Now, I want to talk for a minute. We didn't talk about this at the time, but let's look at the word united. And in the Greek, it's sympathos. I think that's the way you pronounce it, sympathos. What does that mean? make you think of in terms of an English word do you see symphony. symphony I am so glad you see it because if you think about that okay and this is actually if you look up the definition it's going to give you grown along with planted together inextricably intertwined there are some other ways you could describe it but I want you to think for a minute about the English word symphony what makes something a symphony as opposed to a solo? Okay, and I'm thinking of Robin back there. I know she can chime in on this. So it, yeah, it, you've got to be united. You've got to be working together. There are so many more interest, uh, instruments involved in a symphony 
because if you're a solo, it's just you. What if out of a symphonic piece, you only heard the oboe? Would you maybe even recognize what the song is? Yeah. Absolutely not. But if everyone works together to contribute their individual parts to the whole, then you hear the beautiful sound created when everything is mixed together. And it's far different from what the individual pieces are, the individual parts. Now, that's one example. I want to give you one more. Okay. And this is for you Southern loving people. <laughs> and we all love our Southern food. Uh, Wayne Barber describes this as, um, the, think of it as how you would make a biscuit. It takes a number of ingredients to make a biscuit. If you've ever made biscuits, you got to have flour. You got to have some kind of shortening. You got to have water. You got to have baking powder. You get all your ingredients together and you mix it up. And then when you bake that biscuit, what comes out can't be separated back into the individual parts. Yeah. It's become something completely different. And that's what it means when you're, we're united with Christ. You remember when we studied this, we talked about it almost becomes impossible for somebody to see where you end and Christ begins because you're so intertwined. And so that, you think about it this way, your life is a holy biscuit. Okay. <laughs> Somebody asked, I, yes. <laughs> yes. You can have all of these members here who are all playing different instruments and being very, very good, accomplished at their particular instrument. But unless they are tuned to the same thing, you have a mess. Oh, excellent. So I'm so glad you shared that, Robin, in case you didn't hear all that. She said a big part of the symphony functioning is you've got to be tuned to the same instrument. And so as we are united with Christ, if we're not tuned to our head, Christ, you you get something that's not a lovely sound. <laughs> uh, it, it, way, yeah. The teaching and for my nurses, and I'd say you got to work as a team. So if you play, you know, the single bells, and you play like Christmas, and you play this, we're going to start together, and they all sing, you know, bring music with us. It's we to work together. It's not going to happen. Exactly. You know, so whether it's the tone or the music that you're playing, like a lot of us go on our own tune, our own make, you know, our way of doing things. Exactly. Okay, I can already tell I'm I'm going to have a hard time making this in 10 minutes. So I'm going to get going. Now, we also saw we have a responsibility in this process of sanctification, which is to stop presenting the members of our body as instruments of unrighteousness to what is it that we if we're presenting our members of our body as unrighteousness to what is it that is unrighteous that we do that we shouldn't sin. Exactly. Paul clearly commands us that in our own flesh, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, we are unable to control the desires of the flesh. But as a new creature in Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit within us, we can overcome those fleshly urges. But you know what? God is a gentleman, and he will never override your free will and turn you into a puppet. So instead, he gives us the privilege of participating in his will when we surrender to his power and we stop trying to make things happen in our own flesh. Believers still have the power to sin when they fail to stay yielded to the Holy Spirit, but a true believer will come under conviction and not be able to lead a lifestyle of sinfulness. Got a comment? Oh, I'm sorry. I was oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Little side note there. Hello. Just being friendly. Okay. So, <laughs> so I just want to say it is possible to have a brief, and I'm going to say relatively speaking, brief period of willfully choosing sin. But a true believer will eventually submit to the Lord in repentance. And we talked about that a lot when we went through there. Okay. 1 John 2, 19 says they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they all are not of us. In other words, there will be pretenders in our midst. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they are 
knowingly, consciously being pretenders, they may think they're really believers, but they're still operating in the flesh. And so we need to be aware that there's always that possibility. And, and that's why we want to make sure we're tuned to the right instrument and we're not being led astray by teachings of men who may be not tuned to the right instrument. Now, Paul dove deeply into the process of sanctification. He got very transparent in chapter seven of Romans, describing the struggle we face as we battle the fact that our inner man, who's united with Christ, still resides in what kind of body? A body of flesh. And so at times the struggle is real and we don't do what we know we should do or we do what we hate. But we got to chapter eight. And what did we see in the first two verses? Here we go. Ready? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Very good. And he goes on to explain that we are adopted as sons and we cry out, Abba, Father, or Daddy, in a deeply personal relationship to the Lord. And then he spends some time reminding us that part of being united with Christ means we will suffer with him. But absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. You have been foreknown and predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ and as one predestined, you have been called and you have been justified and finally glorified. And it's a done deal. That's what God has ordained to be accomplished. So rest in that knowledge. Okay, that was supposed to be the 10 minute recap is more like 15. Um, but we are now ready to start into chapter nine. So what we're going to be talking about here is Paul wants to fully develop a concept that he brought up at the end of chapter eight. You remember when we talked about predestination, <clears throat> excuse me, foreknowledge and the concept of election very briefly. If I were to ask what you would say is the basis for those topics, what characteristics or quality of God do you think we're really talking about when we talk about predestination? It's that God is sovereign that is it and do you think most humans struggle with that idea the idea that god has ultimate rule and authority i think many do and so with the apostle with the possible exception of the last few years we as americans did we not grow up with the idea you can be anything you want to be with hard work and determination that yeah that mindset i would say within the last few years because we kind of have a lot of victims now in America, but you know, before then that was sort of the way that we thought. And I think that that makes some people very uncomfortable. So what we're going to look at is hopefully giving us some foundation to kind of wrap our brains around this, because a lot of times people just ignore what makes them uncomfortable. So we're going to start with the first, reading the first five verses in Romans 9. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Now, it almost sounds like Paul might be taking a detour here until you put this into context of the rest of the letter. You remember from the recap how we said he was spending much more time trying to point out to the Jews their error in trying to live by the law instead of living by faith in Christ? Well, he stated in Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So I want you to put yourself in the position of these Jews he's addressing in the letter for a moment. What is it they've been relying on for their standing before God? The law. And it was the law and specifically as it related to God's promises to Israel. 
So did he choose Israel to be his called out people? Yes, he did. So doesn't it sound like Paul may be telling them that, well, that deal is gone. Now God has a new favorite team, you know, the church, which includes the Gentiles. And so consequently, Paul wants to address two topics, which many Christians may find uncomfortable at best or confounding and contradictory because of either preconceived ideas or lack of teaching on these concepts. So what we're going to look at is the sovereignty of God and his purpose and plan for Israel. So here we go into chapter nine. Look at Paul's heart as he begins this new division. He begins by expressing the depth of his love for his countrymen and the depth of his despair over their rejection of Christ. He even calls on the Holy Spirit as his witness in much the same way that one would place your hand on the Bible in a court of law and swear to tell the truth and nothing but the whole truth. Okay, he goes so far as to say in verse three, he would be willing to give up his own salvation if it would bring salvation to Israel. Now, is there anyone in your life that you love so deeply that you would forfeit your own salvation? Especially someone who doesn't return that love to you. I want you to think. With, with Paul, first of all, he's demonstrating that it's not just right thinking for good theology. It also has to be having a heart filled with holy emotion. And it's even more remarkable when you think about the fact that Paul, the way he was treated by the Jews, this is his heart toward them. What We have covered this many times. What are some of the things that the Jews did to Paul after his conversion? He was stoned. Do you remember how he had 39 lashes, not once, but twice. Um, he was imprisoned multiple times. These people who hated him so much that they either wanted to see him injured or killed. He has this kind of compassion for them. All right. So keep that in the back of your mind as we frame this. Now, he then spends the next few verses listing some advantages that God gave the Jews that make their rejection of God even worse. So we're going to look at this list briefly. First, they're Israelites. Now, they were named that after Jacob wrestled with God and God changed his name. God identified them as a special chosen people who would bless others because of this special position that God just, I mean, is there any reason? Could God have chosen somebody else? Absolutely. But God chose the Jews that he wanted to work through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them this blessing. Now, he has kept that promise. If you ever looked at the list of like Nobel Prize winners and laureates, there are so many scientists, doctors, other elite thinkers that have blessed the whole of mankind for centuries that have been Jewish, okay? That's number one. Secondly, he says they've received adoption as sons. Now, this is not exactly the same reference as what we discussed earlier in chapter eight of Romans, because that was directed to believers. Instead, let me give you a few verses. And if you want to make some notes of this to go back and look in greater detail later, Exodus 4, 22, here's what God told Moses to say to Pharaoh. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Also, Hosea 11.1, 1, Hosea 11.1 1 says, when Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So what we see is that God not only called them out as a special people, but he gave them a position of sonship. And I want you to think about this kind of tying it back to the other reference we had in chapter eight, the security of a believer as God's adopted son extends also to the national adoption of Israel. If God could unadopt Israel, be done with them, say, even though I gave you a promise, you didn't do what I expected you to do. So I'm done with you. That would mean that he could unadopt us as New Testament believers and our salvation would be insecure. 
but we know that's not true. And so the reason is the security of this adoption is based upon these three things. First of all, the promises that God has made to believers and to Israel. Okay. We have security of adoption as sons because God has made promises both to believers and to Israel. It's also based on the character of God. Is God faithful? Yes, he is. And can God lie? No, he cannot. So the character of God means he's not going to go back on his word. And the third thing is God is the one doing the work. It doesn't depend on what I do or what you do. If he's adopted you as his son, as his child, he's the one doing the work. Okay. Now, Here's the third thing in the list that Paul has. They had glory revealed to them. Now, the Greek word for glory is doxa, D-O-X-A, which we get what word from that? Doxology. I know in the Baptist church, we don't really sing the doxology very often. There's some other denominations that do, but it simply means... <laughs> glory we're giving glory to god if you're singing the doxology and when did the israelites see his glory what's probably the most memorable time moses mount sinai in fact were the people so overwhelmed by the glory that they just couldn't even take it and they were like moses you go talk to god you know this this yeah can't can't and you couldn't even see his face and so what he did is he revealed his shekinah glory or the visible manifestation of his presence to his people, Israel. He filled the glory of Moses' tabernacle in the Holy of Holies with his with God's glory. Later, he did it in Solomon's temple. And you know what? One day, we're going to be able to experience his glory in the New Jerusalem. Amen to that. Okay, so here's the next thing. Number four, they received the covenants. They received the covenants. Now, we could bog down here for a while discussing covenant. And in fact, Precept Ministries has a pretty awesome course just studying covenant. But let me give you a, a kind of in a nutshell what it uh, covenant means. I've got up there the Greek word that, and this is a transliteration because if you just looked at it in the, if I say Greek, it's Hebrew. If you just looked at it in the Hebrew, it you couldn't say it in English because of how it, it's constructed. But typically it's transliterated as barith, which means to cut. Okay, literally to cut. Now we get a clear picture of this process if we go to Genesis 15 and we see God cutting covenant with Abraham the process was animals were brought and they were cut in half and the pieces were laid across from each other and the parties that were entering into covenant would pass between these pieces of flesh after they made their vows and the passing between the pieces of flesh signified, if I break this covenant, may God do to me what's been done to these animals. That's how solemn it wasn't just, okay, I'm going to give you my word. And if I change my mind, it's no big deal. That's what it was. But here's what's significant. In Genesis 15, did they both pass through the pieces? Who did? Only God. And that's because... God is a covenant keeping God. He vowed to Abraham and his descendants and it's totally incumbent upon God to keep it. It wasn't two parties. God's the one that said, here's what I'm doing. Abraham was in kind of a sleep state witnessing this, but he did not walk through the pieces. He promised a land, a seed and a blessing. It is irrevocable and not dependent on any action of man. And so the Abrahamic covenant is the first covenant God made with his people. Oops, I see I put covenant in there twice, sorry. Who will become the nation of Israel. This was actually before they became Israel, but that was the first covenant. The next one would be the Mosaic covenant. All right. And Brother Sam has been taking us through this in his sermons in Exodus. And what did he explain? Exodus 20, the giving of the law is really a picture of what? Remember? It's like a 
Dun, 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 dun. It's like a marriage license, right? And so the story in Exodus is leading up to chapter 20, where we see God courting his bride. He is asking her if she'll enter into this covenant with him. The people of Israel said yes. And then we get the giving of the law, which is sort of like, okay, here's the guidelines. This is what this marriage is supposed to be. Well, how well did Israel do with that? They were unfaithful just about out of the gate. They didn't even leave Mount Sinai before they broke their end of the bargain. And this one was not a one-sided covenant like the Abrahamic covenant was. And so here's what we need to understand. Marriage is one of the few biblical covenants that we enter into as God's children today. So we need to be careful. We understand the magnitude of the commitment when we say the words, I do. God doesn't take it lightly and neither should we, okay? Now, after that, we see the Davidic covenant. And the Davidic covenant was given in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16. And God covenants with David that one will come from, forth from him to sit on the throne forever. It's really a confirmation of the promise of the seed, which was given in the Abrahamic covenant, all right? And then here's the last one we're going to list, the new covenant. So Jeremiah 31, 33 is where we see the inauguration kind of, of, of an explanation. This is coming. We, we can point back further in scripture to kind of see glimpses of mm, there's something more coming. But Jeremiah 31, 33 really gives us a picture of what's involved with it. Uh, Jesus with his disciples in Matthew 26, 28, during the last supper, he further explained. Um, and then in Hebrews 8, 6, we get some more information about the new covenant. And it is the fulfillment of the blessing given in the Abrahamic covenant, given to Israel, but as believers, what is our relationship in this? We're grafted in by our faith in Jesus Christ, right? So unlike man, who sometimes makes vows he doesn't keep, God is faithful and he never breaks his covenant vows. All right. So the Jews were given the law. We've talked about that quite a bit. We know this refers to the law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, the, could the law ever save? Could the law save anybody? No, but it was given as a privilege or a benefit provided to show their need for a savior. And as John 1, 17 says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. They were given the temple service. God gave some very clear instructions about how the Israelites were to conduct worship in the temple. The priestly tribe of Levi had very specific jobs related to the care and function of the temple. Sacrifices took place in a specific area. Um, there were specific pieces of furniture or instruments placed in the, temple, in the temple, and God gave very clear rules about who was permitted to enter into the Holy of Holies and when. We could develop an entire study on these elements of the temple and God's instructions in order to see that they're all a type or a shadow of worship in the heavenly realm. Each element in the temple represents something about Jesus and God's plan of salvation. There's nothing in the temple or temple worship given by God that was arbitrary. What a privilege to have been entrusted with this foreshadowing of how Jesus could lead them into the very presence of God. They were given the promises. Now, we've already covered that they had the covenant promises, but here's where I think we, we see this is this sort of the stumbling block that occurred for the Jews, the other promises that they knew about. They knew they were promised to have who come? Who were they looking for? A Messiah, exactly. So they knew a Messiah would come to deliver them. And I've got listed on your sheet part of what those promises include. It was the fact that there would be a messianic reign from Jerusalem. It's the fact that Israel would be gathered to permanently possess the promised land. And the restoration of Jerusalem, which would give a time of great blessing. Now, Keep in mind that the focus on these particular elements of God's promises is what really caused the Jews to miss Jesus in his first coming and to see him as the Messiah. They were looking for one who would fulfill these parts of the prophecy 
and they overlooked the parts about a suffering savior. Now, do we sometimes have the same tendency to want to focus on what we personally desire to see occur and miss other necessary requirements in the process? We need to be careful of that. They were descendants of the fathers of the faith, namely Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the last one that Paul uh, lists here is that Christ came through the Jews in his lineage as a man. We know that Jesus was fully God, yet fully man. But there's some important facts to consider uh, and to understand about why he was born a Jew. Now, first, he had to be a Jew by birth to meet the qualifications to be the promised Messiah. Remember, we had the promise of the lineage in the Bible. So he had to be a Jew in order to be qualified to be the Messiah. But have you thought about this? Our participation in the new covenant also hinges on the Jewishness of Jesus. If you look at Jeremiah 31, 31, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a covenant, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. If you go to verse 33, this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declare the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart, I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So God gave the new covenant to the Jews and only Jesus being a Jew allows us to be included in the new covenant. In other words, Jesus couldn't have been inaugurated by the new covenant without being a Jew and we can't be grafted in by faith either. either. So in Ephesians 2 verse 11, it says, therefore remember that formerly you Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God, <clears throat> excuse me, without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances mm -hmm. that he himself might make the two into one new man. Mm -hmm. So, as we look at these first five verses of chapter nine of Romans, I want you to reflect on your own life. We've studied Paul's explanation of the gospel and sound doctrine in these first eight chapters. We know what we should believe, but we also know we're in a body of flesh, which means at times we don't always live as we know we should. So can we all agree that in our own personal world, things you face daily might somewhat be described as dysfunctional at times I, I think probably more often than not because people sin and circumstances can be hard people will hurt us and sometimes we hurt others even though it may be unintentional but before we get into the meat of chapter nine which is going to deal with God's sovereignty please take a hard look at yourself and your mindset from two particular perspectives so first Ask yourself, how deeply do you love others? Paul felt such a burden for his fellow countrymen. He was willing to give up his own salvation if it would provide salvation for them. He doesn't say this in relation to Mrs. Paul or his children or any other close relative, but he says this about people who actively hated him and wanted to see him injured or killed. Now, I know just as Paul did that it's impossible to trade your salvation for anyone else's. But look in your heart to see if you have that depth of love for others that you desire their salvation to that degree. And I have to confess, I've been deeply convicted over this as I've studied these past couple of weeks. It's so easy to look at others and think, well, you're reaping the consequences of what you've sown. You know, you made your bed, now lie in it. Or you just look at somebody and you think, well, that's one of those people because they obviously hold views that are unbiblical. But the truth of the matter is no matter how much they've hurt me or no matter um, how they may have rejected God, my heart should be so burdened for their salvation that I would be willing to trade places. If possible, 
although it's not, to see them in right relationship with the Lord. And it doesn't mean that I don't function because I am so overwhelmed by the sadness of the condition of the loss, but it means I haven't become calloused to the reality of life being condemned to hell if they continue to reject the gift of salvation offered by Christ. Okay. Now, last question is this. Are you guilty of not allowing the advantages or benefits God has given you to draw you to a close relationship with him? We went through the list of how God had proven himself to Israel and provided great advantages to them as his chosen people. And the very ones he did this for were in large part the ones who rejected Jesus. So what has God done in your life? Compared to most of the world, have we not received tremendous blessing just by the fact that we're born in the United States? I mean, we've been blessed with opportunity to have our very own copy of his word. We have access to almost every sermon that's been preached over the last 60 years and some beyond that that are now available to us on the internet or in a library. And we've been grafted into the blessings of the new covenant and experienced life as part of the body of Christ. Now, this doesn't even include personal blessings that I know each one of us have received. I am so very grateful that God, in his mercy, provided a godly man to be my husband and allowed us the opportunity to have four wonderful children. But has life presented some challenges at time? Absolutely. But my life is so much richer because of these experiences and the relationships he's developed through those challenges and so my prayer is that as we begin to really look at God's sovereignty and how it relates to us individually, as well as how it relates to the nation of Israel, we first need to be sure we see who God is by studying some of his attributes in greater depth. That was the purpose of the homework, if you want it. It is optional, but it will greatly enrich your understanding of God and enlarge your capacity to accept and comprehend his sovereignty. And then I pray that as we've studied in Romans up until this point, everything will come into focus to show us if we've grasped the truths that were presented in chapters one through eight. Have you experienced genuine salvation for yourself and come to the realization that indeed you are a sinner and that meant you're a sinner in need of a savior because you can't save yourself. Are you experiencing the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and see that you think differently and you act differently because of that, that you know you can't control your own flesh, but God in you can. And my prayer is that just as we want to be part of that symphony, because we're part of his body, that we can say with Paul that our love for others, especially lost men will drive us to desire nothing more than to see their salvation in Christ. If we can do that, then I think we've got the right perspective to follow Paul's discussion of God's sovereignty as we look at chapters 9 through 11. So may he open our eyes and our hearts as we try to take in these truths and earnestly seek him. And I know I probably pushed it a little bit today. So I thank you guys for your attention. We have questions, comments. Okay. Well, I know we've got 